Chapter Fifty Nine of Pride and Prejudice. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Chapter Fifty Nine. My dear Lizzie, where can you have been walking to? was a question which Elizabeth received from Jane as soon as she entered their room, and from all the others when they sat down to table. She had only to say in reply that they had wandered about, till she was beyond her own knowledge. She coloured as she spoke, but neither that nor anything else awakened a suspicion of the truth. The evening passed quietly, unmarked by anything extraordinary. The acknowledged lovers talked and laughed, the unacknowledged were silent. Darcy was not of a disposition in which happiness overflows in mirth, and Elizabeth, agitated and confused, rather knew that she was happy, than felt herself to be so. For besides the immediate embarrassment, there were other evils before her. She anticipated what would be felt in the family when her situation became known. She was aware that no one liked him but Jane, and even feared that with the others it was a dislike which not all his fortune and consequence might do away. At night she opened her heart to Jane. Though suspicion was very far from Miss Bennet's general habits, she was absolutely incredulous here. "'You are joking, Lizzie. This cannot be. Engaged to Mr. Darcy. No, no, you shall not deceive me. I know it to be impossible. This is a wretched beginning, indeed. My sole dependence was on you, and I am sure nobody else will believe me if you do not. Yet, indeed, I am in earnest. I speak nothing but the truth. He still loves me, and we are engaged." Jane looked at her doubtingly. "'Oh, Lizzy, it cannot be. I know how much you dislike him. You know nothing of the matter. That is all to be forgot. Perhaps I did not always love him so well as I do now. But in such cases as these a good memory is unpardonable. This is the last time I shall ever remember it myself." Miss Bennet still looked all amazement. Elizabeth again and more seriously assured her of its truth. "'Good heaven! Can it really be so? Yet now I must believe you,' cried Jane. "'My dear, dear Lizzy, I would—I do congratulate you. But are you certain? Forgive the question. Are you quite certain that you can be happy with him?' "'There can be no doubt of that. It is settled between us already that we are to be the happiest couple in the world. But are you pleased, Jane? Shall you like to have such a brother?" "'Very, very much. Nothing could give either Bingley or myself more delight. But we considered it, we talked of it as impossible. And do you really love him quite well enough? Oh, Lizzie, do anything rather than marry without affection. Are you quite sure that you feel what you ought to do?" "'Oh, yes. You will only think I feel more than I ought to do when I tell you all." "'What do you mean? Why, I must confess that I love him better than I do Bingley. I am afraid you will be angry." "'My dearest sister, now be serious. I want to talk very seriously. Let me know everything that I am to know without delay. Will you tell me how long you have loved him?" "'It has been coming on so gradually, that I hardly know when it began. But I believe I must date it from my first seeing his beautiful grounds at Pemberley." Another entreaty that she would be serious, however, produced the desired effect, and she soon satisfied Jane by her solemn assurances of attachment. When convinced on that article, Miss Bennet had nothing further to wish. "'Now I am quite happy,' said she, "'for you will be as happy as myself. I always had a value for him. Were it for nothing but his love of you, I must always have esteemed him. But now, as Bingley's friend and your husband, there can only be Bingley and yourself more dear to me. But, Lizzie, you have been very sly, very reserved with me. How little did you tell me of what passed at Pemberley and Lambton! I owe all that I know of it to another, not to you." Elizabeth told her the motives of her secrecy. She had been unwilling to mention Bingley, and the unsettled state of her own feelings had made her equally avoid the name of his friend. But now she would no longer conceal from her his share in Lydia's marriage. All was acknowledged, and half the night spent in conversation. "'Good gracious!' cried Mrs. Bennet, as she stood at a window the next morning. "'If that disagreeable Mr. Darcy is not coming here again with our dear Bingley, what can he mean by being so tiresome as to always be coming here? I had no notion but he would go a-shooting or something or other, and not disturb us with his company. What shall we do with him? Lizzie, 
You must walk out with him again, that he may not be in Bingley's way." Elizabeth could hardly help laughing at so convenient a proposal, yet was really vexed that her mother should be always giving him such an epithet. As soon as they entered, Bingley looked at her so expressively, and shook hands with such warmth, as left no doubt of his good information, and he soon afterwards said aloud, "'Mrs. Bennet, have you no more lanes hereabouts in which Lizzie may lose her way again to-day?' "'I advise Mr. Darcy, and Lizzie, and Kitty,' said Mrs. Bennet, "'to walk to Oakham Mount this morning. It is a nice long walk, and Mr. Darcy has never seen the view.' "'It may do very well for the others,' replied Mr. Bingley, "'but I am sure it will be too much for Kitty. Won't it, Kitty?' Kitty owned that she had rather stay at home. Darcy professed a great curiosity to see the view from the Mount, and Elizabeth silently consented. As she went upstairs to get ready, Mrs. Bennet followed her, saying, "'I am quite sorry, Lizzie, that you should be forced to have that disagreeable man all to yourself. But I hope you will not mind it. It is all for Jane's sake, you know, and there is no occasion for talking to him, except just now and then. So do not put yourself to inconvenience." During their walk it was resolved that Mr. Bennet's consent should be asked in the course of the evening. Elizabeth reserved to herself the application for her mother's. She could not determine how her mother would take it, sometimes doubting whether all his wealth and grandeur would be enough to overcome her abhorrence of the man. But whether she were violently set against the match, or violently delighted with it, it was certain that her manner would be equally ill-adapted to do credit to her sense, and she could no more bear that Mr. Darcy should hear the first raptures of her joy than the first vehemence of her disapprobation. In the evening, soon after Mr. Bennet withdrew to the library, she saw Mr. Darcy rise also and follow him, and her agitation on seeing it was extreme. She did not fear her father's opposition, but he was going to be made unhappy, and that it should be through her means, that she, his favourite child, should be distressing him by her choice, should be filling him with fears and regrets in disposing of her, was a wretched reflection, and she sat in misery till Mr. Darcy appeared again, when looking at him she was a little relieved by his smile. In a few minutes he approached the table where she was sitting with Kitty, and while pretending to admire her work, said in a whisper, "'Go to your father. He wants you in the library.' She was gone directly. Her father was walking about the room, looking grave and anxious. "'Lizzie,' said he, "'what are you doing? Are you out of your senses to be accepting this man? Have you not always hated him?' How earnestly did she then wish that her former opinions had been more reasonable, her expressions more moderate! It would have spared her from explanations and professions which it was exceedingly awkward to give. But they were now necessary, and she assured him, with some confusion, of her attachment to Mr. Darcy. "'Or, in other words, you are determined to have him. He is rich, to be sure, and you may have more fine clothes and fine carriages than Jane. But will they make you happy?' "'Have you any other objection,' said Elizabeth, "'than your belief of my indifference?' "'None at all. We all know him to be a proud, unpleasant sort of man, but this would be nothing if you really liked him." "'I do. I do like him,' she replied with tears in her eyes. "'I love him. Indeed, he has no improper pride. He is perfectly amiable. You do not know what he really is. Then pray do not pain me by speaking of him in such terms." "'Lizzie,' said her father, "'I have given him my consent. He is the kind of man, indeed, to whom I should never dare refuse anything which he condescended to ask. I now give it to you, if you are resolved on having him. But let me advise you to think better of it. I know your disposition, Lizzie. I know that you could be neither happy nor respectable unless you truly esteemed your husband, unless you looked up to him as a superior. Your lively talents would place you in the greatest danger in an unequal marriage. You could scarcely escape discredit and misery. My child, let me not have the grief of seeing you unable to respect your partner in life. You know not what you are about." Elizabeth, still more affected, was earnest and solemn in her reply, and at length, by repeated assurances that Mr. Darcy was really the object of her choice, by explaining the gradual change which her estimation of him had undergone, relating her absolute certainty that his affection was not the work of a day, but had stood the test of many months' suspense, and enumerating with energy all his good qualities. She did conquer her father's incredulity, and reconcile him to the match. "'Well, my dear,' said he, when she ceased speaking, "'I have no more to say. If this be the case, he deserves you. I could not have parted with you, my Lizzie, to any one less worthy.' To complete the favourable impression, she then told him what Mr. Darcy had voluntarily done for Lydia. He heard her with astonishment. "'This is an evening of wonders indeed! And so Darcy did everything! made up the match, gave the money, paid the fellow's debts, and got him his commission. 
so much the better. It will save me a world of trouble and economy. Had it been your uncle's doing, I must and would have paid him. But these violent young lovers carry everything their own way. I shall offer to pay him to-morrow. He will rant and storm about his love for you, and there will be an end of the matter." He then recollected her embarrassment a few days before, on his reading Mr. Collins' letter, and after laughing at her some time, allowed her at last to go, saying, as she quitted the room, "'If any young men come for Mary or Kitty, send them in, for I am quite at leisure.'" Elizabeth's mind was now relieved from a very heavy weight, and after half an hour's quiet reflection in her own room, she was able to join the others with tolerable composure. Everything was too recent for gaiety, but the evening passed tranquilly away, there was no longer anything material to be dreaded, and the comfort of ease and familiarity would come in time. When her mother went up to her dressing-room at night, she followed her and made the important communication. Its effect was most extraordinary, for on first hearing it, Mrs. Bennet sat quite still, and unable to utter a syllable. Nor was it under many, many minutes that she could comprehend what she heard, though not in general backward to credit what was for the advantage of her family, or that came in the shape of a lover to any of them. She began at length to recover, to fidget about in her chair, get up, sit down again, wonder, and bless herself. "'Good gracious! Lord bless me! Only think! Dear me! Mr. Darcy! Who would have thought it? And is it really true? Oh, my sweetest Lizzy, how rich and how great you will be! What pin-money, what jewels, what carriages you will have! James is nothing to it, nothing at all! Ah, I am so pleased, so happy! Such a charming man, so handsome, so tall! Oh, my dear Lizzy, pray apologise for my having disliked him so much before. I hope you will overlook it. Dear, dear Lizzy! A house in town, everything that is charming! Three daughters married, ten thousand a year! Oh, Lord! What will become of me? I shall go distracted!" This was enough to prove that her approbation need not be doubted, and Elizabeth, rejoicing that such an effusion was heard only by herself, soon went away. But before she had been three minutes in her own room, her mother followed her. "'My dearest child,' she cried, "'I can think of nothing else. Ten thousand a year, and very likely more! Tis as good as a lord! And a special license! You must and shall be married by a special license! But, my dearest love, tell me what dish Mr. Darcy is particularly fond of, that I may have it to-morrow." This was a sad omen of what her mother's behaviour to the gentleman himself might be, and Elizabeth found that, though in the certain possession of his warmest affection, and secure of her relation's consent, there was still something to be wished for. But the morrow passed off much better than she expected, for Mrs. Bennet luckily stood in such awe of her intended son-in-law that she ventured not to speak to him unless it was in her power to offer him any attention or mark her deference for his opinion. Elizabeth had the satisfaction of seeing her father taking pains to get acquainted with him, and Mr. Bennet soon assured her that he was rising every hour in his esteem. "'I admire all my three sons-in-law highly,' said he. "'Wickham, perhaps, is my favourite, but I think I shall like your husband quite as well as James.' End of chapter 59「Pride and Prejudice » by Jane Austen Chapter 60 Elizabeth's spirit soon rising to playfulness again, she wanted Mr. Darcy to account for his having ever fallen in love with her. "'How could you begin?' said she. "'I can comprehend your going on charmingly when once you had made a beginning, but what could set you off in the first place?' I cannot fix on the hour, or the spot, or the look, or the words which laid the foundation. It is too long ago. I was in the middle before I knew that I had begun. My beauty you had early withstood, and as for my manners, my behaviour to you was at least always bordering on the uncivil, and I never spoke to you without rather wishing to give you pain than not. Now be sincere. Did you admire me for my impertinence? For the liveliness of your mind, I did. You may as well call it impertinence at once. It was very little less. The fact is that you were sick of civility, of deference, of officious attention. You were disgusted with the women who were always speaking and looking and thinking for your approbation alone. I roused and interested you because I was so unlike them. Had you not been really amiable, you would have hated me for it. But in spite of the pains you took to disguise yourself, your feelings were always noble and just. 
and in your heart you thoroughly despised the persons who so assiduously courted you. There, I have saved you the trouble of accounting for it, and really, all things considered, I begin to think it perfectly reasonable. To be sure, you knew no actual good of me, but nobody thinks of that when they fall in love." "'Was there no good in your affectionate behaviour to Jane while she was ill at Netherfield?' "'Dearest Jane, who could have done less for her? But make a virtue of it by all means. My good qualities are under your protection, and you are to exaggerate them as much as possible. And in return it belongs to me to find occasions for teasing and quarrelling with you as often as may be. And I shall begin directly, by asking you what made you so unwilling to come to the point at last. What made you so shy of me when you first called, and afterwards dined here? Why, especially when you called, did you look as if you did not care about me? Because you were grave and silent, and gave me no encouragement. But I was embarrassed. And so was I. You might have talked to me more when you came to dinner. A man who had felt less might. How unlucky that you should have a reasonable answer to give, and that I should be so reasonable as to admit it. But I wonder how long you would have gone on, if you had been left to yourself. I wonder when you would have spoken, if I had not asked you. My resolution of thanking you for your kindness to Lydia had certainly great effect. Too much, I am afraid, for what becomes of the moral of our comfort springs from a breach of promise. For I ought not to have mentioned the subject. This will never do. You need not distress yourself. The moral be perfectly fair. Lady Catherine's unjustifiable endeavours to separate us were the means of removing all my doubts. I am not indebted for my present happiness to your eager desire of expressing your gratitude. I was not in a humour to wait for any opening of yours. My aunt's intelligence had given me hope, and I was determined at once to know everything." "'Lady Catherine has been of infinite use, which ought to make her happy, for she loves to be of use. But tell me, what did you come down to Netherfield for? Was it merely to ride to Longbourn and be embarrassed, or had you intended any more serious consequence?" "'My real purpose was to see you and to judge, if I could, whether I might ever hope to make you love me. My avowed one, or what I avowed to myself, was to see whether your sister was still partial to Bingley, and if she were, to make the confession to him which I have since made. Shall you ever have courage to announce to Lady Catherine what is to befall her? I am more likely to want more time than courage, Elizabeth, but it ought to be done, and if you will give me a sheet of paper, it shall be done directly. And if I had not a letter to write myself, I might sit by you and admire the evenness of your writing, as another young lady once did. But I have an aunt, too, who must not be longer neglected." From an unwillingness to confess how much her intimacy with Mr. Darcy had been overrated, Elizabeth had never yet answered Mrs. Gardiner's long letter. But now, having that to communicate which she knew would be most welcome, she was almost ashamed to find that her uncle and aunt had already lost three days of happiness, and immediately wrote as follows. I would have thanked you before, my dear aunt, as I ought to have done, for your long, kind, satisfactory detail of particulars, but to say the truth I was too cross to write. You supposed more than really existed. But now suppose as much as you choose. Give a loose rein to your fancy, indulge your imagination in every possible flight which the subject will afford, and unless you believe me actually married, you cannot greatly err. You must write again very soon, and praise him a great deal more than you did in your last. I thank you again and again for not going to the lakes. How could I be so silly as to wish it? Your idea of the ponies is delightful. We will go round the park every day. I am the happiest creature in the world. Perhaps other people have said so before, but not one with such justice. I am happier even than Jane. She only smiles. I laugh. Mr. Darcy sends you all the love in the world that he can spare from me. You are all to come to Pemberley at Christmas. Yours, etc. Mr. Darcy's letter to Lady Catherine was in a different style, and still different from either was what Mr. Bennet sent to Mr. Collins, in reply to his last. Dear Sir, I must trouble you once more for congratulations. Elizabeth will soon be the wife of Mr. Darcy. Console Lady Catherine as well as you can. But if I were you, I would stand by the nephew. He has more to give. Yours sincerely, etc. Miss Bingley's congratulations to her brother on his approaching marriage were all that was affectionate and insincere. She wrote even to Jane on the occasion, to express her delight, and repeat all her former professions of regard. Jane was not deceived, but she was affected, 
and though feeling no reliance on her, could not help writing her a much kinder answer than she knew was deserved. The joy which Miss Darcy expressed on receiving similar information was as sincere as her brother's in sending it. Four sides of paper were insufficient to contain all her delight and all her earnest desire of being loved by her sister. Before any answer could arrive from Mr. Collins, or any congratulations to Elizabeth from his wife, the Longbourn family heard that the Collinses were come themselves to Lucas Lodge. The reason of this sudden removal was soon evident. Lady Catherine had been rendered so exceedingly angry by the contents of her nephew's letter, that Charlotte, really rejoicing in the match, was anxious to get away till the storm was blown over. At such a moment the arrival of her friend was a sincere pleasure to Elizabeth, though in the course of their meeting she must sometimes think the pleasure dearly bought, when she saw Mr. Darcy exposed to all the parading and obsequious civility of her husband. He bore it, however, with admirable calmness. He could even listen to Sir William Lucas, when he complimented him on carrying away the brightest jewel of the country, and expressed his hopes of their all meeting frequently at St. James's, with very decent composure. If he did shrug his shoulders, it was not till Sir William was out of sight. Mrs. Phillips's vulgarity was another, and perhaps a greater tax on his forbearance, and though Mrs. Phillips, as well as her sister, stood in too much awe of him to speak with the familiarity which Bingley's good humour encouraged, yet whenever she did speak, she must be vulgar. Nor was her respect for him, though it made her more quiet, at all likely to make her more elegant. Elizabeth did all she could to shield him from the frequent notice of either, and was ever anxious to keep him to herself, and to those of her family with whom he might converse without mortification, and though the uncomfortable feelings arising from all this took from the season of courtship much of its pleasure, it added to the hope of the future, and she looked forward with delight to the time when they should be removed from society so little pleasing to either, to all the comfort and elegance of their family party at Pemberley. End of chapter 60《Pride and Prejudice》by Jane Austen Chapter 61 Happy for all her maternal feelings was the day on which Mrs. Bennet got rid of her two most deserving daughters. With what delighted pride she afterwards visited Mrs. Bingley, and talked of Mrs. Darcy, may be guessed. I wish I could say, for the sake of her family, that the accomplishment of her earnest desire in the establishment of so many of her children produced so happy an effect as to make her a sensible, amiable, well-informed woman for the rest of her life, though perhaps it was lucky for her husband, who might not have relished domestic felicity in so unusual a form, that she was still occasionally nervous and invariably silly. Mr. Bennet missed his second daughter exceedingly. His affection for her drew him oftener from home than anything else could do. He delighted in going to Pemberley, especially when he was least expected. Mr. Bingley and Jane remained at Netherfield only a twelvemonth. So near a vicinity to her mother and Meryton relations was not desirable even to his easy temper, or her affectionate heart. The darling wish of his sisters was then gratified. He bought an estate in a neighbouring county to Derbyshire and Jane and Elizabeth, in addition to every other source of happiness, were within thirty miles of each other. Kitty, to her very material advantage, spent the chief of her time with her two elder sisters. In society so superior to what she had generally known, her improvement was great. She was not of so ungovernable a temper as Lydia, and removed from the influence of Lydia's example, she became, by proper attention and management, less irritable, less ignorant, and less insipid. From the further disadvantage of Lydia's society she was of course carefully kept, and though Mrs. Wickham frequently invited her to come and stay with her, with the promise of balls and young men, her father would never consent to her going. Mary was the only daughter who remained at home, and she was necessarily drawn from the pursuit of accomplishments by Mrs. Bennet's being quite unable to sit alone. Mary was obliged to mix more with the world, but she could still moralize over every morning visit and as she was no longer mortified by comparisons between her sister's beauty and her own, it was suspected by her father that she submitted to the change without much reluctance. As for Wickham and Lydia, their characters suffered no revolution from the marriage of her sisters. He bore with philosophy the conviction that Elizabeth must now become acquainted with whatever of his ingratitude and falsehood had before been unknown to her, 
and in spite of everything, was not wholly without hope that Darcy might yet be prevailed on to make his fortune. The congratulatory letter which Elizabeth received from Lydia on her marriage explained to her that, by his wife at least, if not by himself, such a hope was cherished. The letter was to this effect. "'My dear Lizzie, I wish you joy. If you love Mr. Darcy half as well as I do my dear Wickham, you must be very happy. It is a great comfort to have you so rich, and when you have nothing else to do, I hope you will think of us. I am sure Wickham would like a place at court very much, and I do not think we shall have quite money enough to live upon without some help. Any place would do, of about three or four hundred a year, but however do not speak to Mr. Darcy about it, if you had rather not. Yours, etc. As it happened that Elizabeth had much rather not, she endeavoured in her answer to put an end to every entreaty and expectation of the kind. Such relief, however, as it was in her power to afford, by the practice of what might be called economy in her own private expenses, she frequently sent them. It had always been evident to her that such an income as theirs, under the direction of two persons so extravagant in their wants and heedless of the future, must be very insufficient to their support, and whenever they changed their quarters, either Jane or herself were sure of being applied to for some little assistance towards discharging their bills. Their manner of living, even when the restoration of peace dismissed them to a home, was unsettled in the extreme. They were always moving from place to place in quest of a cheap situation, and always spending more than they ought. His affection for her soon sunk into indifference. Hers lasted a little longer, and in spite of her youth and her manners, she retained all the claims to reputation which her marriage had given her. Though Darcy could never receive him at Pemberley, Yet, for Elizabeth's sake, he assisted him further in his profession. Lydia was occasionally a visitor there, when her husband was gone to enjoy himself in London or Bath, and with the Bingleys they both of them frequently stayed so long, that even Bingley's good humour was overcome, and he proceeded so far as to talk of giving them a hint to be gone. Miss Bingley was very deeply mortified by Darcy's marriage. But as she thought it advisable to retain the right of visiting at Pemberley, she dropped all her resentment, was fonder than ever of Georgiana, almost as attentive to Darcy as heretofore, and paid off every arrear of civility to Elizabeth. Pemberley was now Georgiana's home, and the attachment of the sisters was exactly what Darcy had hoped to see. They were able to love each other even as well as they intended. Georgiana had the highest opinion in the world of Elizabeth though at first she often listened with an astonishment bordering on alarm at her lively, sportive manner of talking to her brother. He, who had always inspired in herself a respect which almost overcame her affection, she now saw the object of open pleasantry. Her mind received knowledge which had never before fallen in her way. By Elizabeth's instructions, she began to comprehend that a woman may take liberties with her husband which a brother will not always allow in a sister more than ten years younger than himself. Lady Catherine was extremely indignant on the marriage of her nephew, and as she gave way to all the genuine frankness of her character, in her reply to the letter which announced its arrangement, she sent him language so very abusive, especially of Elizabeth, that for some time all intercourse was at an end. But at length, by Elizabeth's persuasion, he was prevailed on to overlook the offence, and seek a reconciliation, and after a little further resistance on the part of his aunt, her resentment gave way either to her affection for him, or her curiosity to see how his wife conducted herself, and she condescended to wait on them at Pemberley, in spite of that pollution which its woods had received, not merely from the presence of such a mistress, but the visits of her uncle and aunt from the city. With the gardeners they were always on the most intimate terms. Darcy, as well as Elizabeth, really loved them and they were both ever sensible of the warmest gratitude towards the persons who, by bringing her into Derbyshire, had been the means of uniting them. End of chapter 61 End of Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen